Hi, my name is Hannah Buckner and I'm one of the America educators here at the museum. Um, welcome to Inside the Fairbanks. Um, it's, this has been a series that we've been doing inside the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium while the museum is shut down during, during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And so for the last uh, week, few weeks, probably about the last month or so, um, we've been showing you different exhibits around and um, talking a little bit about them, what's in there, some stories behind them, and um, their exhibits that are near and dear to our hearts. And so um, today we're going to be talking about um, some endangered animals that we have um, on exhibit. Um, we won't be able to see all of them just because some stuff is being moved around, but um, you know, we're going to see some endangered animals as well as um, a couple of extinct animals that we do have in the case. Um, that were previously on the endangered list. So um, I hope you enjoy it and get to learn a little bit more about um, the endangered animals in our, in our world and um, actually in our country. And so um, maybe it'll take you um, to be inspired to do something to protect them. So um, why don't you sit back, relax, and um, let's get so started. So we're here in the south side of the museum um, looking at the endangered species case um, in the wall. Um, you'll note that we have both mammal and avian um, species in here, and we'll talk a little bit about um, which are extinct and critically endangered and maybe possibly came back. Um, but first, we're going to really um, look at um, the signs and be able to s sort of explain what each of the little symbols mean. So you'll see um, with each of the animals that we have, they ha well, except for the Northern Oriole, they have symbols on them. So we're going to talk a little bit what that means. So if you look to the left of the exhibit, you'll see that we have a list of how um, species can become ex endangered or extinct. So you'll see that we'll either have listed that the habitat was destroyed either due for agriculture, fuel, or um, things that humans need um, for the growing populations. We also have excessive, excessive hunting or harvesting of animals and plants for food or sale, um, which can really severely harm um, many species. There's pollution of the air and water, so poisons, um, particles, sediment and chemical things that get into the, either the ground or the air and can harm um, actually us and the other animals. There's pesticides that are sprayed on crops um, or can get into the water and so that can disrupt um, the natural food web. Um, and both air and water pollution and pesticides can um, be actually uh, occurring because of certain fertilizers. So um, there's actually a big push for that in um, taking care of uh, the uh, ground around us. So um, that's something that farmers actually look into. Um, also alien species, doesn't mean that they came from another planet, but it just means that species that aren't naturally occurring in certain places. So um, they either were introduced to the area by man. Um, well, no, they were introduced by man either um, on purpose or not on purpose. Um, and they can have really destructive consequences for native plants and animals for those regions. And then also natural causes. Um, so things like kite climate cycles, uh, genetic mutation, uh, natural disasters, and habitat change. So um, first we'll take a look at the koala. So we'll see that the koala is um, facing um, some uh, critical um, status because of the habitat destruction and as well as alien species. Um, so the koala um, that we know um, can live in places such as Australia and um, we actually do know that they are facing some severe habitat destruction because of the wildfires that were occurring in Australia, particularly in early months of this year before the coronavirus actually hit us. Um, so we have one on here and you'll see that they have um, really long nails that help them grip the trees that they stay on because um, they eat eucalyptus and they'll stay on those trees. We have a doll sheep. I believe this is a ram. Um, I could be mistaken. Um, they are endangered because of excessive hunting. Um, so it's possible that 
um, they could be gone because of the fact that people are hunting them for probably their meat and their fur and possibly their horns as a prize. Um, you'll see as I zoom in a little bit, we have a northern oriole. So we don't necessarily know um, if these birds are um, endangered in the U.S., but they could be because of the rainforest destruction that's actually occurring throughout uh, South America. Um, which is sad because it is quite a beautiful bird. Um, we also have the ivory-billed woodpecker um, that is facing um, endangerment um, due to pesticides and habitat destruction. So actually, the ivory-billed woodpecker, because we don't necessarily know its current status, it lives in um, the southern region of the U.S. and Cuba. And so it could either be critically endangered or extinct, but we just don't know. Um, these birds have red on the back of its head um, and that long bill that um, woodpeckers have so they can dig into trees. And it has um, very distinctive white markings on the neck and to the back, um, which is interesting. Um, we also have a whooping crane, whooping crane. And these birds are facing extinction uh, not extinction, but they're endangered due to quite a number of things. Their habitats are being destroyed. Um, they're being excessively hunted um, and harvested. They are um, experiencing pesticides in their habitats, which is um, destroying the land that they live on and in the water. And there's also, in addition to pesticides getting in the crops or water that's around them, they're facing poison um, either by air or water pollution, which also can occur from pesticides. Um, but these birds can be pretty tall. I would say they are probably, with their head height, almost as tall as me, um, or at least the size of your average middle schooler. Um, they have red on the head and really long beaks that kind of remind me of the woodpeckers. Um, and they have those long nails, um, on the tips of their feet, their little toes on the front, and they have um, like ankle spurs that come out of the back that also have little like nails on them. And that's our whooping crane. Now we're reaching some of the um, more critically endangered animals. You'll see that this, we have a Bengal tiger that are um, quite common in the Asia region of our planet. Now the Bengal tiger is quite massive and um, they can live in jungles um, and unfortunately this magnificent creature that um, I would never have seen up close before working in a museum, um, they are facing extinction because of um, habitat destruction in the forests, um, particularly um, on the Indian region of um, Asia and they're also being hunted for their pelts or their fur um, and they're considered a prize hunt. So um, unfortunately magnificent creatures like this are losing numbers and there's a possibility that they will no longer exist and the only time we'll ever be able to see them are in museums. Um, now this animal right here is called a condor. It's a bird that um, I think commonly in um, movies, at least Disney movies, we see them as um, like almost like vultures, or at least that's how I've perceived them. Um, they're actually quite magnificent. Um, back home for me, there's a couple of condors in the zoo that is near my house, and they were very terrifying, but also very awe-inspiring. Um, because of just how magnificent they were when they were flying. Unfortunately, the California condor is critically endangered and is facing extinction um, a lot. Um, that is unfortunately really sad. Um, but they're facing, um, well, they're critically endangered because of um, just a number of things, just like the crane. Um, the condor um, is having their habitat destroyed. They're being over hunted. Um, you know, there's natural causes that are um, 
occurring like climate change, which I'm sure is not making it easy with California fires that have been occurring and drought, making it hard for animals to live and so they can't hunt. And there's also air and water pollution, which um, makes it difficult, um, especially if there's like haze. Um, I imagine that's not very good for uh, birds because it can impact their wings. Now, if an animal goes from beyond critical, extinct, uh, critical endangerment, they'll become extinct. The Carolina parakeet and the passenger pigeon um, both are now extinct because of overhunting and their environment being destroyed. Um, so you won't ever see these again in the wild. The only place you'll ever see them is in a museum if someone has donated them. Um, so that's kind of what things are happening with all of these animals. Um, that's why it is up to us to protect them and care for our environment because it's not just us. All of these animals are part of a very intricate and balanced, well, a fragile balance of a food web and um, just like a, a very fragile ecosystem. They all play a part just like we do. And if we don't care and respect for the land that is home to these as well, they will die out and we need them. Hopefully though, they will end up like the bald eagle. Now the bald eagle is one of the big success stories of caring for animals that are very endangered. Um, there used to be in the 1950s, I believe, about uh, around the 400s of nesting pairs of bald eagles. Um, and there was a lot of work done to bring back the species. And so now they are no longer endangered. Um, so there's actually, I believe, 10,000 nesting pairs. Um, so that is really good. Um, you'll recognize that the bald eagle is the symbol of our nation of freedom. Um, and my hope is that that was not the only reason for um, trying to bring this bird back. Um, just because if we have it in our power to save life, we should do it. Um, our lives are not more important than animals. Um, so that is the bald eagle. Um, you'll note that the bald eagle has um, big wings, um, really, really long feathers, um, and that color of brown and white and um, a beige-ish beak that curls down um, and then some really sharp talons that can catch prey and grip on trees where they um, can nest and perch. So again, it is up to us to care for the, our environment and our planet because there's only one planet that we can have, um, at least for right now, but we shouldn't be looking to the future and ignore the problems that we have now. We should be looking after what we have and take not take for granted the lives that we share the planet with. So um, I hope this was informative and um, soon you'll be hearing some stories from Bo and um, I hope this inspires you to act for change. So thank you for watching um, this segment of uh, endangered species. And um, again, uh, we have to be careful when we're interacting with our environment and as we're um, hunting and getting materials that we need because we can encroach and destroy on um, these animals that are so important to the ecosystems of our planet. And so um, I just encourage you to look into that. And um, Bo, our collections director, will be telling us some stories about these. So um, thank you for watching and have a wonderful day. Hello everyone, and welcome to the second portion of this week's uh, Inside the Fairbanks. Um, and as you saw with Hannah's video, we're, today we're talking about uh, the uh, extinct and endangered animals that we have represented in the museum's collections. Uh, so we're going to jump right in. Um, this is obviously a, a very important um, and significant issue for the, the world, and uh, as a result, it's um, an important issue for uh, natural history museums to talk about. Um, 
So the animals that you saw in our case are um, some of the more uh, charismatic and interesting uh, animals that are um, extinct and in danger. Um, there are also others uh, that are endangered and extinct in museums collections that we won't have time to talk about today. Um, but if you have questions about others, uh, feel free to contact the museum. We'll do our best to um, tell you more about what we, what we have. So, um, extinction uh, relates to a, another very important issue, uh, which is um, biodiversity, which is um, really important. Uh, having a greater uh, amount of biodiversity um, is very important um, for the planet and for people for a variety of, um, of, of reasons. Um, not only uh, can they uh, can they affect ecosystems in which they live, but um, having increased biodiversity um, uh, means increased uh, ecosystem productivity, uh, increased crop production, and increased variety of crops, uh, protecting fresh water and increased soil formation, uh, aiding in the breakdown of pollutants, which of course, um, it's good for protecting the environment and also contributing to climate stability. Um, and there are other reasons too, but those are some of the more significant ones, especially as it relates to people and um, our um, having a, a livable environment. So um, I'm going to share my screen here uh, with you. Um, for a moment. Uh, <clears throat> so you see here with these two charts, um, this chart on the left shows the percentages of different types of animal and plants and other life on this, uh, types of life on this planet. Uh, you can see um, here insects to make up half or a little more than half of the number of our types of plant, uh, animals, sorry, types of life on this planet. Um, you can see here there are other invertebrates, um, which would include things like crabs and um, other animals. Um, here are plants and algae, fungi, other organisms, vertebrates, which include people um, and things like tigers and birds and um, that sort of thing. Um, only, or only about 1% of the um, uh, life on this planet. As many as of them as there are, there are about 10,000 birds and uh, species in this, in this in the world and um, large numbers of other uh, vertebrates, but they only make up about 1% of the species on the planet. This chart shows um, the number uh, that are threatened with extinction um, by, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, amphibians being the most with almost 30% threatened with extinction. Mammals are, even though they're only one, less than 1% of the species, have about 20% that are threatened with extinction and birds are also less than 1%. They are maybe 12 or 13% um, threatened of the species are threatened with extinction, uh, according to this chart. Um, so, moving right along, um, you saw in Hannah's video um, this uh, male uh, ivory billed woodpecker. We also have a female um, ivory billed that is um, up and out our temporary exhibit, which in which we x rayed some of our natural history specimens. Um, so all these specimens were collected when they, they were, obviously they were still around and um, were even plentiful, or, or relatively plentiful. Um, but our, these first um, ones that we're gonna talk about are now actually extinct, um, which is amazing that, um, especially for uh, the passenger pigeon, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so the ivory-billed woodpecker uh, was, this, this, these specimens were collected in the 1880s and um, went into Franklin's Fairbanks's collections and came to the museum. And um, the reasons for uh, their um, 
These actually are, I should clarify, are officially classified as critically endangered. And there are sightings or possible sightings every year of them, including one from 2005 that included video of a possible sighting of them. So we're not sure that this one's extinct, but there have been no confirmed sightings of it for uh, many, many years. Uh, in the US, it was um, 1944 that the last confirmed ivory billed woodpecker uh, was seen. And in Cuba, it was later than that um, for the Cuban subspecies. But um, uh, habitat loss um, and which was a major part of the extinction um, or why these went extinct. Um, they require not only mature forests, but um, mature forests with uh, standing large trees uh, that are dead, um, which in which they find their, their food. Um, so the um, destruction of their habitat, largely for logging, um, led to the demise of this bird. Um, and uh, moving along, uh, well, actually, uh, the, this shows the historic range uh, in the U.S. of the ivory-billed woodpecker, um, you know, the approximate range. Um, and here we see two of the museum's five passenger pigeons. This pair was um, collected around the same time, maybe a little bit later at, than the um, as the ivory-billed woodpeckers that we have. Although at that time in eighteen 80s or 1890s, the, their numbers were significantly reduced. Um, and uh, originally, uh, at, you know, when the Europeans first came to this continent and a little bit after, there were billions of these, uh, and these birds around in flocks of millions, such that they um, blocked out the sun when they flew over and took hours or even uh, a day, full day, to pass over overhead, and um, one of the major factors in the passenger pigeon going extinct was hunting. They were hunted largely are for sport, but also as a food source. Um, and um, the last known passenger pigeon died in the Cincinnati Zoo. Uh, she was it was a female called Martha. Um, and she died September 1st, 1914, and uh, she was, I believe, 29 years old, and um, she, uh, yeah, so it's amazing to think that in between 1800 and uh, 1900, the numbers were uh, virtually down to zero, and then only uh, less than 15 years later, um, they were completely extinct, um, due, largely due to human activity, direct human activity. Um, and um, you can see here the range of the passenger pigeon. The dotted line is the uh, distribution, and the um, red line here is the primary uh, breeding area. Of, of where they reproduce. Um, another bird is the Carolina parakeet that we have in our collections. This is a pair that are mounted together uh, in a similar way to the passenger, passenger pigeons we just saw. This pair was um, collected in 1895 and um, th this is one of the only, this is the only um, species of parrot that was found in um, the continental U.S. in the eastern continental U.S. The only other one found that used to be found in the U.S. was the thick-billed uh, parrot, which is was found, is found from predominantly in Mexico and used to extend into southern southwestern uh, U.S. But um, does not doesn't anymore. Um, and the Carolina parakeet, um, also the last known specimen, was in the at the Cincinnati Zoo, and it died in uh, February 21st, uh, 1918. Um, and um, so moving on a little bit uh, to um, some endangered species that we have, which are not extinct, but are um, critically endangered. Um, well, the uh, 
Kiwi, which we see here on the left, is actually listed as vulnerable, but its numbers have significantly decreased in the last um, couple of decades. Um, they, there are about 68,000 of them left in uh, New Zealand primarily, um, although they are found in some zoos around the world. Um, there are uh, management pro pro uh, projects in New Zealand to manage their um, wild populations which includes um, an, a, a breeding program that, uh, in which a lot of the wild eggs are actually collected and incubated and hatched um, in labs or other facilities um, in an attempt to um, increase the numbers of, of these very interesting birds. Uh, one interesting fact about them is they are the largest, they're a bird with the largest egg to body size ratio uh, of any bird. Um, the threats include uh, low reproduction rate, uh, which is often a factor, uh, but also invasive species and habitat loss. Um, and it's similar for the kakapo, which is this um, large ground parrot, also um, native to uh, New Zealand. Um, it is critically endangered with only 211 known um, birds uh, at the end of 2019. And um, one of the efforts to um, you know, protect this bird and try and bring its numbers back is a pretty extreme measure of um, taking all the remaining uh, birds and moving them to some islands on which they um, rid the, got rid of all mammals, which are one of the threats to this bird, since there are, um, are only a few species of bat that are native to Hawaii, that all, all the rest were imported, either intentionally or in, unintentionally, uh, by humans. Um, those include uh, um, hunting dogs and rats, which have really done quite a number on the numbers of these, these birds. Um, so hopefully we can find a way to bring these two birds and others that are in similar situations uh, back um, and um, help, keep, help keep from losing them entirely. Um, and um, then we have a couple of success stories that are represented in the collections. Uh, everyone knows what this bird is, I'm sure. Uh, it's the bald eagle the national symbol of, one of the national symbols of the United States. Uh, it's one of the great conservation stories um, out there. Um, there used to be, uh, in the early 18, in the 18th century, uh, 300 to 500,000 of these birds um, in, the, in the world. Um, but by the 1950s and early 60s, there were um, four, only 417 breeding pairs in the lower U.S., in the continental U.S., and uh, that was due to hunting because of uh, fear of them. They thought people thought that they went after um, livestock, uh, but also uh, uh, DDT, which many of you have heard of, was a chemical pesticide that um, was widely used uh, and um, thinned the shells of um, of a lot of birds, including the eagle, as well as the California condor, which you see here. Um, but then the, um, that was uh, identified, the risks that, um, of it were identified and it was banned. The um, Endangered Species Act was um, went into effect in 1966, and um, it, so it was heavily protected um, by law and uh, with penalties that were enforced, and um, it came back um, pretty quickly after that, or well, relatively quickly. It took several decades, but um, now it is back over to over 100,000 um, animals uh, in the wild, and it is found in every state in, in the U.S. now, um, maybe excepting uh, Hawaii, but uh, from Alaska to Florida, and California to Maine, there are um, nesting bald eagles now. Um, so in some cases, only one nesting pair, but um, in some cases, there are hundreds of nesting pairs, even in the 
uh, lower 48 uh, states. Um, and another success story is uh, this California condor. Uh, this specimen that we have uh, in the museum's collections, it's the only, only specimen we have, but it was, uh, sorry, uh, it was collected in um, 1882 in the uh, San Bernardino uh, Mountains of Southern California um, and is an adult male. Um, uh, these birds are one of the largest flying birds uh, in that is still living. Um, it can reach up to 26 pounds and has a wingspan of up to about 10, uh, 10 feet. Uh, the longest uh, wingspan of any living bird is actually about only 12 feet long, uh, which is the uh, wandering albatross. Um, so the this bird um, was also affected by DDT and um, a slow maturation rate, um, like some other birds, and poaching and lead poisoning from um, shot, you know, hunting shot, and also habitat destruction. Um, and similar to the kakapo, all um, uh, of the in 1987, the remaining 22 birds. Um, were captured and went into an intensive breeding, breeding program. And uh, it's amazing to think that there were only 22 and um, the comeback that they've had, um, relative uh, comeback that they've had is uh, amazing. Um, they uh, did a very successful breed, captive breeding program. And uh, the first uh, were released uh, only a, a few years later in 91 and 92, and um, a big uh, milestone was that um, in 2003, uh, the first wild born, um, uh, wild hatched um, condor uh, fledged and um, went off on its own in 2003, which was the first time since 1981. And then, um, by 2011, there were 394 birds, uh, 205 of which were uh, in the wild. And uh, in 2020, um, uh, there are 518, 337 of which are found in the wild. Um, so um, there has been a large very large monetary cost of about $445 million. But um, it's uh, saving these some of these species. Um, this is an apex predator and um, it's key to having a, a balanced ecosystem. And um, it shows the su success that you can have, but um, it's also um, a relatively small cost in some 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 people's opinion that um, of what uh, of having a, a balanced and stable uh, and sustainable ecosystem uh, might be. Um, so uh, that's a very quick um, and somewhat rushed maybe um, overview of some of the endangered and extinct uh, specimens that we have in, in, at the Fair, in the Fairbanks Museum's collections. But I um, hope that when we reopen, <coughs> excuse me, when we reopen, um, you're able to come back to the museum and see some of these amazing animals. And um, as always, let us know if you have any questions and we'll um, do our best to answer them um, as quickly as we can. Uh, so thanks, thank you again. And, um, Please uh, join us again next week.